With millions of Americans suddenly dependent on benefit payments, the pandemic has presented a somewhat antiquated banking industry, to say the least, with a pretty huge challenge. Our next guest, Brian Brooks, the new head of the U.S. National Bank's regulator, says they all need to innovate to keep up. He's granted a banking license to a fintech company, which has raised a few eyebrows, but he's also opened a new avenue for existing banks, allowing them for the first time to hold cryptocurrencies, digital assets, for safekeeping. It perhaps should come as no surprise, as he's the former chief legal officer of Coinbase Global, the biggest U.S. exchange for cryptocurrencies. Brian Books, the acting U.S. controller of the currency, joins us now. Brian, fantastic to have you with us. I'm really excited to, uh, to have you on. You sort of have a 21st century view of what the banking sector should look like. And uh, I said it's raising a few eyebrows. It's raising a few more. Give me a sense of what your vision is. Well, Julia, thanks for so much for having me. And these are really important questions to ask in a time like this. You know, this is a time when Americans are depending on their banking system more than they ever have before. When we made a decision collectively in this country to shut down the economy very broadly back in March, we depended on the banks to deliver benefit payments in the form of paycheck protection uh, program uh, loans and checks sent from the Treasury Department. And the problem is we were sending those across 19th century banking rails. Many people said that it took days or sometimes weeks to receive their payments. And my vision is that we need to get to a place in this country where payments can be transmitted virtually instantaneously, where errors can be eliminated. And it turns out technology exists today that can help us do that. So we need to get there, I think, sooner rather than later. You've talked about a new payment charter. What does that mean? And what is the technology that we have today that exists that circumvents, to your point, the 19th century rails that the, the train has been running on so far? Well, it's, it's really interesting, uh, Julia. If you look at the payments business over the last 30 years, there was a time when all payments happened through the banking system. And in the last 10 or 15 years, with the rise of fintech, largely dominated by a bunch of Silicon Valley firms, it turns out that technologies exist, whether they're based on blockchain or other kinds of networks, that allow payments to go much faster. And as a result of that, what's happened in this country is that millions and millions of daily payments no longer are principally processed by banks. They're run by companies like PayPal and Stripe and Square. The question for the payments charter is, do we think it's a good thing or a bad thing that all of that activity is now happening outside the banking system where the examiners who work in my agency can look at them and make sure that there's fraud being prevented and make sure consumers are protected? Or do we think it would be better for them to run entirely outside of regulation? I think the best solution, which you see in other parts of the world, including the UK today, is to have faster payments that are innovated by private companies but are supervised by federal watchdogs like us. Th that, I think, is what the future looks like. I mean, the pushback that you're getting on getting here is from existing banks, whether at the, the state level or those that are federally, federally regulated. I mean, they have existing businesses, I guess, to protect. The problem is they don't best serve the customer. Well, that's the thing, Julia. And if you look at what the, what the reason is why so much payments activity has moved outside of the banking system, part of it is because consumers want to receive their services in a different way. I mean, let's face it, there was a time when we all used to buy our clothes in department stores where we could also get our oil changed and have lunch. The world changed on the high street shopping market, right? Now we all go to, to boutique stores. We buy our computers at Apple, our jeans at the Levi's store, et cetera. Banks are sort of the last bastion of the amalgamated comprehensive supermarket, if you will, of financial services, but that's not the way consumers shop anymore. The other thing that's really important is markets look at these companies very, very differently. So it turns out the return on equity for startup tech companies is far higher than the return on equities uh, for banks, which is what creates strong market incentives for these services to move into specialty platforms and outside of comprehensive banks. All of which means that if we don't rethink what the bank charter is, and find a way for the bank charter to be broad enough to encompass services that were historically provided by banks, we're going to have a problem. SWIFT. Some people will recognize this term, others won't, but it's the way right now that the system works and the information, the money is passed between banks and it, the last thing it is is SWIFT. It's clunky, it's slow. Those outside of the industry, particularly in the fintech sector, know there are better options. Brian, is this the plan to replace, improve on the existing infrastructure that SWIFT is at this moment? Well, uh, Julia, you make a great point that SWIFT is one of the most ironically named organizations in the world. Um, the joke in my world is that if you wanted to move money from America to Australia, the fastest way to do that 
is to load it in a suitcase and put it on an airplane, which is a little bit crazy <laughs> in the right? So to me, what has to happen is there are faster solutions and they exist in other parts of the world. So the UK, Singapore, China, many of our global competitors have adopted real-time payments. In the US, that seems to be still years away unless we allow existing technologies to do the work for us. And, and I think that's very possible. Brian, how quickly can you do this? How quickly can you achieve this given, as we've discussed, there are, there are existing resistant points and they're pretty powerful in this country? Well, they, they are, Julia, but in the world, there's nothing more powerful than markets because markets represent what millions of consumers want every day. And so my job is, is not to build new payment rails. My, my job is to identify impediments that make it harder for people to get what they want and need. And at the OCC, we have an ability to do that. So among those include the questions of, should banks be allowed to participate in the cryptocurrency market at all? Should banks be allowed to connect to blockchains? Should we have central bank digital currencies, perhaps issued by private companies, but backed by bank deposits? I can identify what the impediments to that are and try and solve that so people can get what they want as they express through markets. I think that's very possible. Brian, very quickly, I read recently that 15% of Americans now own some form of digital asset or a cryptocurrency. You also want to tackle this and make sure that banks can provide services as far as digital assets are concerned. You're trying to protect consumers again. Well, look, in a world where 50 million Americans do hold cryptocurrencies and many, many millions more outside of this country do, to me, we can't ignore that phenomenon. So I, I am not a crypto bull nor a crypto bear, but I recognize reality. A lot of people have this stuff. They have it for good reasons, and we need to make sure it's accessible to them in the same safe and sound way that they can get their checking account. So, so that's our role, is to innovate as people change the way they consume financial services in the future. Yeah, I have to say, I find you a breath of fresh air, but I, I can see you're going to be a whirlwind to, to others. Brian, we will continue this conversation. Uh, thank you so much for uh, describing your role and what your plans are. We'll continue this conversation soon. Brian Brooks, acting U.S. Comptroller of the Currency. Thank you for that.